Good morning. All are welcome here as we gather for worship on this Pentecost Sunday.
How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, with its swarms too many to number, living things both small and great. There go the ships to and fro, and Leviathan, which you made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. O Lord, rejoice in all your works. You look at the earth, and it trembles. You touch the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please God. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. Friends, you are going to love Psalm 104. It's a celebration of creation and celebration of God's sustaining care for every part of it. Three great things about 104. One, it harkens back to the two creation stories in Genesis. Two, we get a common table grace from Psalm 104 and we hear about a sea monster. True fact. This is called It's a New Day. Your part goes like this. Breathe into the earth, Holy One, and renew us. It's a new day. Breathe into the earth, Holy One, and renew us. It's a new day. Ready? Breathe into the earth, Holy One.
When the day of Pentecost had come, the apostles were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fires appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Beloved of God, grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I spent nearly the entire day on Friday removing the carpet from the stairs leading to the second story of our home. I don't know yet if it will be replaced with new carpet or if instead the hardwood floors I uncovered can be refinished and restored. I don't know yet where Friday's kneeling and cutting, pulling and prying will lead, but the carpet had to go. It had to go because it was harboring years of filth, and it had to go because on Friday I needed to deconstruct something, dismantle something, make visible progress towards something. 
because Friday marked the end of a week when the number of people in this country who have died of COVID-19 surpassed 100,000. Because Friday marked the end of a week when George Floyd was killed and Minneapolis and St. Paul burned. Because Friday marked the end of a week when the headlines included words like these, nationwide protests, the maddening normalcy of racism, retaliating, withdraw, suspicions, discriminates, lawsuits, caught in the middle, the battle between the masked and the masked knots. Because Friday marked the end of a week when I searched the scripture, begging to see clearly, and then in some sort of divine object lesson actually went to my annual eye exam and learned that my prescription hasn't changed. I have 20-20 vision with my glasses. Of course, you're still extremely nearsighted, my eye doctor said. Yes, I am. I can't see far away. I can't see down this road we're walking as a nation. I can't see the systemic racism and the ever-widening political divisions, the lack of simple civility, the inability to dialogue and empathize. I can't see my way through those right now. I can't see that they will ever change. I don't know how to deconstruct the systems that harbor years of racism and white privilege. I don't know how to dismantle the hatred, the suspicion, the unwillingness to work for the common good, the refusal to see one another as human beings. So on Friday, I pulled up carpet instead, because that I could do. And when I got to the last stair and removed the last staple, I heard NPR's Mary Louise Kelly ask Kianga Yamada Taylor, assistant professor of African American studies at Princeton University, what is giving you hope as you look back over a truly awful week? I could not wait to hear her answer because on Friday, I couldn't see any hope. What is giving you hope as you look back over a truly awful week? Taylor answered, resistance. The events over the last week have shown that people are, even in the midst of this pandemic and social distancing and self-isolation, are going to fight for a different kind of reality. And the struggle on the streets has to be turned into organizing, has to be turned into a set of achievable demands, but it begins with resisting the status quo. No more filthy carpet harboring years of inequity and injustice. No more. It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost. This is a day, a season, a way of being that resists the status quo. This is a day that gives us hope. For the first apostles and for us today, the day of Pentecost means no more waiting for power from on high, no more living in fear, no more suffering without redemption and resurrection, no more idle tales, no more not seeing, no more thinking that restoration of an earthly kingdom is the ultimate goal, but becoming active citizens of God's kingdom. God's dream of peace and justice and abundant life for all the world. No more limits, no more borders, no more small dreams. Pentecost resists the status quo, and when the Spirit comes, it sounds like a violent wind. 
It looks like fire and chaos because when God's spirit is poured out on all flesh, when God's deeds of power are spoken in every language, the world might no longer look the way you thought it should look. And you, we, might look for some way of explaining away this act of resistance on the part of God. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. No one knew what it meant when God's spirit rushed into the world that day. No one understood the ramifications of God's resistance to the status quo. Everyone was nearsighted that day. They couldn't possibly see where that spirit would lead them. But some chose to ask a question to get curious, to wrestle with the implications, to struggle for direction, saying to one another, what does this mean? While others chose to make a judgment, to react with cynicism, to assume that there could only be one reason for such violence and chaos, mm, they're filled with new wine. Peter stands up to address them all. Simon Peter, who met Jesus when his net was empty after a long night's work that ended in nothing. At Jesus' command, Peter cast off his weariness and despair and hauled in an amazing catch of fish. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Peter. From now on, you will be catching people. Peter recognized Jesus as the promised Messiah, God's promised salvation for the world. Peter was there on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured. Peter prepared the Passover meal on that night when Jesus gathered with his disciples for the last time. Peter denied his Savior three times. And then, when the others dismissed the women's experience at the empty tomb as an idle tale, Peter ran to the tomb, looked in and saw that Jesus was not there, and went home amazed. Peter has experienced an ongoing relationship with Jesus, a relationship that has held fear and trust, bold confessions of faith and equally bold failures. And now Peter, transformed by God's word, made flesh, called to fish for people, a witness to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as the promised Messiah, draws on the word of scripture to interpret what is happening to make sense of the world around him, to place this violent wind and burning flame and chaotic speech into the context of God's work in the world. Let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. We are a world on fire, a church on fire, and we are seeing visions this week. We are dreaming dreams. We are prophesying. Presiding Bishop of the ELCA, Elizabeth Eaton, said this week, until a white majority feels so deeply in our soul that the pain of black and brown people is our own pain, it will continue 
to be dangerous to be black or brown in America. Our siblings of color are prophesying, telling the truth about what it means for them to live in this country, lifting up God's dream of justice. The Reverend Dr. Ron Bell Jr., pastor of a church in St. Paul, wrote this week, I think you were so busy looking for a riot that you missed the gathering of the grieving. I think you were so busy looking for looters that you missed the lament and heartbreak of a community. I think you were so busy looking for trouble that you missed the tragedy of systemic racialized trauma on the bodies of black and brown people. Tonight, tomorrow, and even the next day, I beg of you, look again. Look again. Listen again. When the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney says, every Black Lives Matter protest I have ever been to had white agitators who were not part of our march, who defied the instructions of the march leaders and antagonized police and provoked violence. Every single one. Look again, church. Listen again. As the Reverend Dr. William J. Barber II said recently, houses of worship are not essential, but true worship is. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me a drink? When I was a stranger, did you invite me in? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was sick and in prison, did you visit me? We are the church called to true worship, birthed this day, this Pentecost day, by the outpouring of God's Spirit. We, like Peter, have experienced an ongoing relationship with Jesus, a relationship that makes room for fear and trust, bold confessions of faith and equally bold failures. We, like Peter, can say with confidence in God, look again, listen again. God is speaking truth to power, naming the systems of injustice we would just as soon keep covering up no matter how filthy the carpet. God is inspiring visions of a world redeemed, healed, freed from all oppression, united in love. In the voice of resistance, God is working hope for a world weary of sin and death. Professor Taylor, in that NPR interview, named the weariness so succinctly. The idea that the richest country in the history of the world cannot get people face masks, cannot ensure that people will not be thrown out of their houses, cannot ensure that people will be fed, is an abomination. We are weary. We are wary. What is giving you hope as you look back over a truly awful week? resistance, and for me, prayer. The last thing I did Friday night was listen to the music for this worship service. Every song is a prayer. Contrast the words we sing with those headline words I mentioned earlier. Breathe into the earth, Holy One, and renew us. It's a new day. O oh, Holy Spirit, enter in. Gently heal those hearts now broken. Let your good word in doubt and strife be in us, strongly burning. O oh, Holy Spirit, anoint our wounds. Awaken us with lustrous movement of your wings. All creation is restored. Endless singing, true healing 
new life revealing that we might no more in death be lost. We are lost in death. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Help us look again. Help us listen again. Inspire us to resistance of the status quo. Inspire us to embody God's dream of abundant life for all. Amen. we unite in prayer, asking God to send the Holy Spirit on the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church around the globe. For the Eastern Orthodox churches, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For the Roman Catholic Church, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For Protestant and Anglican churches, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For Pentecostal churches, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For Evangelicals and Independents, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. For our own congregations, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. And for everyone who searches for you, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. Restore with your breath the whole creation, especially the lands and waters laden with pollution and the animals whose habitats are threatened. For your earth, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. 
Send your spirit on the leaders of nations, on legislators and on judges, that the people of the world will benefit from your justice and your peace. For the nations of the world, we pray, come, Holy Spirit. Visit all who are suffering, all who feel hopeless, and all who face death. Send healing to those we name here before you now, silently or aloud. For all who are in need, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Restore to health those who have contracted the virus. Uphold health care workers. Grant jobs to those who are unemployed. And assist researchers in discovering a vaccine. For all who are confronting the coronavirus, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. Bless those who are graduating from schools and universities. Give our youth hope for their future. For our graduates, we pray, come Holy Spirit. Show our nation and our churches how to connect with those whose language we cannot speak. End all division, hatred, and suspicion. Help us to see one another clearly through the lens of your love for all creation. For the speakers of every language under the sun, we pray, Come, Holy Spirit. Receive our praise for all who for centuries have gone before us in the faith, from the first Pentecost throughout Christian history and up to this week. But at the end, we and all the saints will rejoice in your presence, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Again today I thank you for your great generosity in sharing the gifts God has given you, in stewarding them so well, your time, your talent, your possessions. Thank you for your generosity. Together we do God's work in the world. Thanks be to God. Today, as part of our offering, I'll invite us to sing another prayer as our offering prayer today. and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beginning Monday, June 1st, tomorrow, and continuing each Monday at 11 a.m., area communities of faith are invited to ring their bells for one minute to mark lives lost and affected by the coronavirus pandemic. This is part of a call for a national day of mourning and lament. You are invited to stand outside at this time each week in solidarity with our communities and the world. And if you're interested in being the bell ringer at either Glenwood or Canoe Ridge, please let me know. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, pour out upon you the Holy Spirit, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.